Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar for the BeWise program. Today we're really excited to have with us Megan Waters from the Utah Department of Health Violence and Injury Prevention Program. She'll be talking about domestic violence and suicide prevention. And um, we want to thank her for taking your time to be with us today. Um, we are, before we begin, just really quick review on how to use the webinar. If you have a question during the presentation, um, basically what you do um, is this bottom section, if you're able to pose a question, it should say questions, and you would post your question there, and we would see it. If you don't see this box um, that says question, then what you do is you go into the view section up at the top of your screen, click there, and then it will take you to um, this next pull down, a drop down box and you would click on questions here to view the questions box. So if you have a question, please feel free to post it in that section and um, we'll go from there. Anyway, thanks again for joining us today. I'm going to turn the time over now to Megan and she is going to um, give her presentation. Megan? Hi, Kaylin. Thank you. Um, do you want to start the recording? <laughs> Let's see. No, and just as a reminder, so I'll take my, okay, here's my screen. Okay. Cool. It looks like Thanks. the recording, it says that it's go. it looks like it's going. Okay, perfect. Just is it, is it? I don't know. Yeah, no, I think so. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about these. Subjects. I'm the Violence Against Women Specialist with the Violence and Injury Prevention Program, um, but I do have a background in suicide prevention work as well. These are really big topics, so I'm going to try to cover them um, as best I can. I'm going to give you a brief overview. Um, first, I want to, let's see, here we go. Um, this can be a sensitive topic and difficult to discuss and address with others, especially as your health coaches. Um, so I just want everyone to note these, these few bulleted items. Um, it's important to kind of put your biases aside when you are interacting with people who may have um, suicidal ideation or be victims of intimate partner violence. Um, be open, always listen and validate feelings. And um, you have a role, so I'm here to kind of help you figure out what you can do to help. Um, this training is really, so the training portion of this is called QPR. Um, and it's really for anyone in a position to recognize a crisis and warning signs. Um, so it's not meant to be a form of treatment. You're not expected to be a counselor in any sense of the word, but um, just so that you can feel more confident in terms of what to do if you encounter somebody who's experienced one of these issues. So that said, this um, take care of yourself during this presentation as well. If we were in the room together, I would tell you to um, step out if you needed to or take a moment for yourself. So practice self-care during these topics. Um, so the S word is suicide. And there are various reasons we don't talk about it. In society. Um, there's a lot of fear around suicide. Um, I've just listed out a few. Um, denial, there's a lot of stigma associated with suicide and mental health in our communities. Um, for some, um, there may be religious connotations of it being a sin. Um, there's a lot of shame. It's a scary topic. Um, People who admit mental health problems may be viewed as weak or sickly. So there's a lot that we're working up against when we're talking about addressing suicide. Um, so we need to kind of bust down all those barriers and just create open, open forms for people to talk about it. So this next part is kind of a quiz, um, but I'm going to go over some data for um, suicide in our state. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the situation with intimate partner violence in the state. And then we'll move into the training, the skills-based part of this presentation. So 
um, there were 570 Utahns who died by suicide last year. Um, I wish that I could talk with you guys because I like to hear reactions to these numbers, but um, this is a lot. Um, we have seen it a lot in the news. Um, most of these headlines are from youth, but we know that many suicides that occur are not youth as well. So here is the trend line. We can see Utah is the blue line, and we've been steadily increasing over the past several years, especially in comparison to the United States. Um, so we're doing a lot to try and address these problems. There are states with suicide concentration. So this Inner Mountain West region here places Utah um, in two, 2012 at number five in the country. Um, there's a lot of theories going around about what um, this can be contributed to, attributed to, and we know that suicide is a very complex, um, a very complex issue, and it cannot be attributed to one thing in particular. But some of um, the factors that we are recognizing, especially within this region, is a large amount of rural areas, which means a lack of access to resources, perhaps a lack of social support. There may be more incidences of isolation. Um, our state has a high rate of firearm ownership, um, so having access to lethal means is definitely a, a consideration. Um, so there have been studies, people always bring this up in presentations, but there's, there's been studies um, originating in Utah that site elevation being a contributing factor to our suicide rate, which I don't want to discount, but I also want to say that it's really complex, so we don't want to pinpoint any one thing as causal for suicide. It's very complex. Um, so deaths are, are just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Um, attempts outnumber deaths by a lot, and then we have ideation, which is pretty overwhelming. Um, so Utah's rank for serious suicidal thoughts in the past year was actually number one. Um, we can see Utah in red on this map here. We're called out as the 6.8% of adults who have had serious suicidal thoughts in the past year. Um, this is pretty pretty shocking. Um, we know that one in 15 Utah adults have had serious thoughts of suicide. Um, and this is from an infographic where we have used social math to kind of demonstrate the data. Um, so it's enough to fill the energy solutions arena in Salt Lake 13 times. You can see um, the data on the bottom in 2013, uh, 570 Utahns died by suicide, which we saw earlier in the presentation, um, and then 4,348 in 2012 attempted suicide. Um, so this statement is a true or false statement, um, just asking whether you think that youth ages 10 to 24 have significantly greater risk of suicide than individuals 65 and older, and the answer to this is false. Um, I think this is an especially important point since we hear a lot about youth suicide, um, but they are definitely not the majority of people who are dying by suicide. And given that your your clientele, I I believe, is um, adults in about this age range, the 45 to 54 population, maybe on either side of that as well, um, those are all age populations that are are at greater risk. So you can see here um, the 45 to 54 year olds are experience the highest rates of suicide. Here is a chart. It's demonstrating um, male-female differences. Um, males are dying by suicide more often than women. Um, we, we know that this is for a couple of reasons. Um, men tend to use more lethal means when um, when attempting suicide. So firearms are more commonly cited in, in suicides of males. Um, they have about a rate four times higher than, than female suicide rates, but females are reporting more suicidal thoughts. In addition, um, this, this graphic kind of shows 
how how many more women are being treated for suicide attempts. So it really has a lot to do with the means of suicide. So the men are using more lethal means. Um, Rates of suicide per 100,000 population, um, this is just for the 10 to 17 category because they are experiencing a very steep incline in the number of um, suicides. However, there's a lot being done to curb this. So efforts are very strong in our state, so just to be encouraged by that. Um, I wanted to demonstrate some racial and ethnic disparities in suicide rates. These are specifically for well, this one actually is for the nation, but we do have some, some Utah-specific data. Um, so we see the American Indian population is very closely um, following the white, white population. White population has the highest rates of suicide, um, with the exception of some um, specific communities or age demographics. So um, we know that access to mental health resources may be a factor in the suicide rate. So overall, this is this is a little bit outdated, but um, it's still pretty relevant. We have the American Indian Alaska Native population um, in Utah experiencing higher rates of suicide. And these are deaths per 100,000 population. Um, I'm going to leave this up here for a little bit. Um, the American Indian population, um, specifically the the younger males, so the the 18 to 25 year old males are experiencing um, especially high rates of suicide. This is a graph showing the incidence of major depression. We know that more than 90% of people who die by suicide had a diagnosable mental health condition. Um, so just looking at this, we know this is all related. If, if clients that you, that you have um, might be struggling with mood disorders, um, it's important to reach out to that population as well, um, especially. So we see in this graphic, we have our American Indian and Alaska Native population and the Hispanic or Latino population experiencing a little bit higher incidence of major depression. This I put up here, I put it up here for a youth presentation. Um, so there are racial and ethnic disparities as I talked about, but significantly more Hispanic female students reported attempting suicide in the last year than black non-Hispanic female students and white non-Hispanic female students. So I just wanted to, to kind of demonstrate how complex this is and it, it really, it differs, the situation differs for different communities um, and different geographically where you're located, it differs. So, um, and then as I was talking about the the Alaska Native and the American Indian population are vastly overrepresented in the suicide data for the 10 to 24 year old age category. Um, 2.5 times higher for the 15 to 34 year old um, nationally. So I touched on this a little bit when we were talking about gender differences, but um, we see many of the suicide deaths contributed to firearm, closely followed by suffocation, which um, is hanging, and then poisoning. The Meets Matter, this is actually a campaign out of Harvard School of Public Health, um, and it's talking about suicide in a way that addresses prevention um, in terms of the means used to, um, to kill oneself. So, Specifically focusing on firearms, we we know from the research that Harvard has done that by reducing access to lethal means, um, death is reduced. So it's, it kind of seems intuitive, but um, it's been enlightening for prevention efforts. Um, so there, they they have done a lot of studies that kind of back this up. Um, and they've, they've kind of asked suicide attempt survivors um, how much time passed between their decision to um, complete suicide and when, when they attempted, and it's a very short window. So recognizing someone in crisis and 
securing firearms, securing lethal means, getting rid of pills in the house. Um, it's a it's a crisis moment. So if you can get get those means out of the house, out of their access um, for that crisis period, then the odds of survival are greatly increased. Um, we can talk more about this, um, but I will move on to um, some some of our recommendations. So part of destigmatizing suicide is talking about it in a way that is sensitive and appropriate for people who may have experienced um, a suicide attempt, a suicide loss in their family. Um, and as, as I hope that I've demonstrated successfully, this is affecting a large number of people in our community. Um, so using appropriate terminology can be can be an easy, really helpful thing. Um, so instead of saying um, committed suicide, so I have the stigmatizing terminology listed out on the right hand side of the screen. So committed suicide um, kind of has a connotation of committing a crime, um, successful suicide. We don't want to say that and that suicide is never a success. Um, a completed suicide makes it sound a little bit clinical, I guess. You're you're checking checking the box on the list of things to do. Um, failed attempt that that um, should be avoided. Um, and then unsuccessful suicide to refer to an attempt. Those are all things that um, we've kind of we've kind of heard a lot and might be used to saying, but they are stigmatizing. So. I've listed the appropriate terminology that we, we as public health prevention specialists um, prefer to use. So died by suicide, ended their life, or took their life are um, less stigmatizing. When we're talking about a suicide that has occurred, it's important to do it safely. Um, so for example, we work with the media if a suicide has occurred. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, emphasizing help seeking, we always want to put the crisis line number. Sorry, <clears throat> we always want to include crisis line information where they can find help, mental health services, in articles that are talking about a suicide that's happened. Um, emphasizing prevention and mental health promotion. So, if you or someone you know is struggling. Um, like intervene as soon as possible, find help, get help, um, do list warning signs and risk protective risk and protective factors in in messaging. So tell people what they should be looking for. Um, you don't know what you don't know. So once we do, um, once we can enlighten people about what warning signs can be, they might be more able to recognize it in someone that they work with, live with, um, you know, anybody. Um, and do highlight effective treatments for underlying mental health problems. OK, so the don't. So when we are talking about a suicide that's happened, we don't want to glorify or romanticize suicide or people who have died by suicide. Um, this happens a lot, especially when there's a celebrity or somebody of high profile that dies by suicide. Um, we don't want to normalize suicide by presenting it as a common event. It doesn't happen all the time. It's not, um, you know, it's, you don't want to present the suicide as something that was out of the blue. You know, we want to emphasize that there, there are experiences that a person has, has been through that contribute to this. It's not due to one thing and one thing only. That makes people more likely to identify with it. Um, so, so kind of sensationalizing these deaths um, produces um, risk for things such as contagion and copycat suicide. So we don't want to focus on any personal details of people who have died or any kind of overly descriptive um, information about, about the death. So I hope that helps. I don't know if it's especially relevant, but I think um, this can inform the way that you um, talk about suicide and deal with suicide if it if it's affecting your workplace, um, your personal life, your professional life. Um, these are good things to keep in mind. So now I want to talk about the connection to intimate partner violence. 
um, as I said, these are really big, really big topics in themselves. Um, so I hope that I can cover it in a good amount of detail because they're important. But um, so we see here, this is a figure representing the prevalence of intimate partner violence reported by adult females during the past 12 months, according to the 2013 Utah Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is a survey of the general population. So um, we see that um, total, there's about 18.9% experiencing IPV in the last 12 months um, with varying um, rates between age groups. So this bullet at the top, IPV survivors are about two times as likely to attempt suicide multiple times. Um, so we know that these are services that should be kind of wrapped up together and victims of, of intimate partner violence should be um, considered for their mental health treatments as well. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about, um, I think I have a figure coming up actually, but um, so Utah ranks relatively low for homicide rates, but um, in terms of domestic violence related homicides, our, um, our proportion is really high. Um, about 42% of homicides in Utah are DV related, um, which is alarming, especially in comparison to, to the nation. Um, and I'm not sure what um, you as BYS coaches are implementing right now, but any kind of screening for IPV and referral to connected resources is really helpful and can potentially mitigate someone's exposure to danger. So there are a lot of screening tools available and I have some resources listed at the end of this presentation if you want to utilize them, but having those um, available to you can be a really good tool. Um, safety planning, um, it's also a way to um, mitigate some risk for any clients you may have that um, this, this may be a concern for. Um, kind of figuring out um, what, what's the best way to keep them safe, um, especially if they are not leaving a relationship that's violent. Um, we also have, so there's, there's a lethality assessment protocol. Um, it's being implemented in Utah right now. If you want more information about locations that are doing that, if they're in your area, if you um, if you feel like this would be a good connection for you to make, please let me know. Um, it's kind of exciting that this is happening. Um, anyway, so here we have overlapping risk and protective factors that I wanted to talk about for intimate partner violence and suicide. Um, a risk factor, I don't know if, you already noticed, but a uh, risk factor is a condition. Um, it's, it's a characteristic condition or behavior about someone's environment or about their individual person that make them more susceptible or at risk for developing certain behaviors or conditions. So in these cases, um, developing um, a suicidal ideation, a suicide attempt, um, or becoming a victim of violence or perpetrating violence. So. Weak health, um, let's see, these are broken down by um, four different layers of, of influence. So the society, community, relationship, and individual levels. Um, I won't read them all to you, but um, we can see there's a lot of places that we can overlap. Um, so when we're talking about prevention or making things a little bit better, um, treating psychological and mental health problems, this, this is beneficial for both IPV and suicide outcomes. Um, substance use, witnessing violence. Um, and then on the flip side, we have protective factors, which we don't know as much about. Um, they're harder to study, um, but they are individual or environmental characteristic conditions or behaviors that reduce the effects of stressful life events. Um, so these are things that mitigate, mitigate risk for um, violence victimization, violence perpetration, and suicide. Um, the coordination of resources and services among community agencies, I think that one is pretty salient for this audience and for our profession in public health, um, and community support and connectedness. connectedness. Um, 
these are some racial and ethnic disparities for IPV and sexual violence. Um, we can see overall about one in three women and one in four men have experienced intimate partner violence in their life, meaning um, a rape, a physical violence, and or stalking um, by an intimate partner. So um, it's important to note, because I always get this, this question, that most violence reported by men was physical violence. But um, I think there's an assumption in our society that men aren't victims of intimate partner violence, but we can see it's affecting a lot of people and definitely some um, underserved communities as well. So American Indian, again, we see with really high rates here, um, multiracial, black, um, and Hispanic are all kind of topping the chart, not to say that um, our white population and the Asian Pacific Islander populations aren't either, but it's a really, it's very prevalent. Um, and so it's good to be aware so that we can then reach out to our clientele who we're serving, um, the communities we work in to kind of mitigate this, this cycle. Um, this is from the National Violent Death Reporting System. This is a little bit old. There are more than 16 states participating now, but Utah has been participating for a while. And we look at circumstances that lead up to a death. So precipitating circumstances for suicide, you can see here um, many, many cited an intimate partner problem leading up to a suicide death. Um, so that's pretty compelling in terms of the connection to these two, two types of violence. I put this up here because um, I thought it was relevant, um, but it really speaks to the cycle, I think, too. So it says, psychologists often pay more attention to the violence in a patient's life instead of how hopeless and helpless that violence makes them feel. Um, so. It's easy to, to look at one thing and ignore another, but um, I think this really speaks to if someone is experiencing violence at home in their personal life, um, that in turn can make them feel really helpless and hopeless, um, which are risk factors for suicide. Um, and then in turn, if someone is feeling really helpless and hopeless, they are more vulnerable to violence that may be perpetrated against them. Um, so it's important to look at the whole picture um, with this. I threw this up here. I really like this um, adverse childhood experiences example. Um, I know that you you all don't work with children per se, but um, you probably work with people who have children. Um, and so this was a study that kind of, um, let me, so we're looking at adverse childhood experiences of Utah people in this next slide. Um, and so it's an 11 question survey that was asked in 2020, 2010 on the BRFSS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Um, and adverse childhood experiences were things such as verbal abuse, having a mentally ill household member, physical abuse, alcohol abuse in the household, witnessing domestic violence at home, touched sexually, touched an adult sexually, raped, so things like this. So the more, um, the more positive answers to those adverse childhood experiences led to um, worse health outcomes across the board. So I just put up here the quality of life one, but we saw, um, we saw on the previous slide um, yeah, current health status and behaviors were negatively impacted, as well as increased risk for suicide and suicide attempts. Um, we see very low, or not very low, but low, lower social support and emotional support for um, these people reporting more than five adverse childhood experiences. So I think the, whole, the connection here, if, if we have um, adults in our care, I guess, um, possible that they were affected by these adverse childhood experiences when they were young. Um, in, in addition, children in their home may also be um, impacted if, if any sort of violence is happening in the home, if a 
parent has a mental health condition that is not being treated. Um, so I just wanted to demonstrate that with that. So now, um, is there any? Has anyone submitted any questions? Should I pause for that? Uh, there are no questions about the presentation. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so this this next portion is the QPR portion. Um, I've kind of modified it a little bit because for the sake of time and we're not face to face. Um, anyway, so it's called the gatekeeper training. Um, it is meant to help you recognize warning signs of suicide, know how to offer help, and know how to get help and save a life. Um, as I said before, um, you're not expected to be a counselor or to offer any treatment to any client. Um, so it's just meant to offer hope through positive action. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the QPR. So question, persuade, refer. This is kind of an analog to CPR. Um, everyone knows CPR um, was they trained a bunch of people in CPR to recognize warning signs of cardiac arrest um, and then to perform an action that would then lead to saving that person's life. So in King County, I believe, in the county in which Seattle sits in Washington, they trained, I think, one in four people in that community in CPR and saw positive health outcomes come from that. So that is one of the, the kind of examples cited in the development of this QPR training. So the idea is that the more and more people that we can train in QPR to recognize warning signs of suicide and to know then what to do for that person, um, the better health outcomes we'll have and the more lives we will have saved. Um, so as I said, not intended to be a form of counseling or treatment, only intended to offer hope. Um, so let's see. Sorry. Okay, so the way this is set up, I'm just we this is part of the core slides from QPR, so I don't necessarily love saying myths. Um, so I'm going to focus on the facts. Um, which are really compelling. So if people in a crisis get the help they need, they will probably never be suicidal again. Um, I think that's, that's something, that's a misconception. People, people don't know if it's, if it's, if there's hope, you know. Um, okay, so the next one, asking someone directly about suicide intent lowers anxiety, opens up communication, and lowers the risk of an impulsive act. So talking about suicide does not, in fact, increase someone's risk for suicide. Um, I think that on the first slide, when I put up the S word and we talked about why, why we don't talk about suicide, I think people are scared that talking about it will make it happen. But it's, it's not true. Um, people who might be experiencing suicidal thoughts um, can feel trapped in those thoughts, and especially with a, with a society or a community that, that um, discourages talking about it, it can produce a lot of anxiety. Um, so having an open space and open ears to listen to those feelings can be very, very helpful. Um, this next one, um, suicide prevention is everybody's business, and anyone can help prevent the tragedy of suicide. Um, for all the reasons we talked about, it is it is overwhelming. But um, if you can do just a small a small referral, a small offering of hope to somebody, um, it's helpful. So it's not just for our mental health professionals. Um, like I was saying with the CPR, it's everybody everybody in the community's business to help prevent these tragedies from happening. Um, Moving on to the next slide. Um, most suicidal people communicate their intent sometime during the week preceding their attempt. So um, this may, we're going to go over some, some clues that might be given, and they're not always obvious. So um, this fact is 
it's valid, but um, you don't know what you don't know. I think I said that already, but if, if we don't know what, what we should be listening for or looking for, then um, it, then it can be, then they can, a suicide can come as a surprise. But um, it, it's important that we educate ourselves on warning signs and behavioral cues that might indicate that somebody is feeling this way. Um, people who talk about suicide may try or even complete an act of self-destruction. Um, so this, this is really um, referencing um, kind of the idea that many people who, who express suicide ideation or suicide intent um, are full of talk or something like that, that they won't actually do it, that they, you know, just need attention. And I would argue that, yes, um, they are looking for attention, but it's probably because they need it. Um, so people, people should take suicidal threats very seriously. Um, and that can be really exhausting for caregivers. So I, I completely recognize that and it's important to set up um, self-care systems. Um, if you're if you are caring for somebody that is suicidal, um, to have somebody um, have somebody to support you as well. Um, so this last bullet here, suicide is the most preventable kind of death, and almost any positive action may save a life. Um, as I as I was mentioning about the moment of crisis, um, this and the means matter thing. So just just offering hope and acting in that moment when somebody is very at risk and very in need, um, that's that's the time to to really act, especially all the time. We should be offering these people hope. But um, yes, so any positive action may save a life. So here at the bottom, how can I help? So we're going to move on to the first letter in QPR, which is Q. Um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we're going to go to suicide clues and warning signs. The more clues and signs observed, the greater the risk. So here are some verbal clues. Um, I'm going to read them. I know that you all can read. But um, I've decided to kill myself. I wish I were dead. I'm going to commit suicide. I'm going to end it all. Um, if such and such doesn't happen, I'll kill myself. So these are really direct clues, right? Um, not everyone um, who might be feeling this way will express um, their feelings in such a direct manner. So this next slide, uh, we have some more indirect verbal cues that might be um, present. So I'm tired of life. I just can't go on. My family would be better off without me. That is, um, that touches on, that one touches on a lot of things. So if someone is feeling like a burden to their family, to their friends, um, that's a risk factor. Um, who cares if I'm dead anyway? I just want out. I won't be around much longer, and pretty soon you won't have to worry about me. Um, these are these can be subtle, but um, if you're listening for them, they are signs um, that that person needs help. Behavioral clues. Um, so. The vast majority of people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental health condition. I think I said that already. But um, so having a mental health condition is a risk factor for sure. Um, however, most people with mental health conditions do not die by suicide. So that's kind of the hopeful flip side of that. Um, anyway, so the. The first bullet here is also very important. Any previous suicide attempt, and the same thing I said for for mental health conditions is true for suicide previous suicide attempts. Um, it is the number one of the number one risk factors for subsequent suicide. However, many people who attempt suicide do not go on to die by suicide. Um, so I know that's kind of. Anyway, you have to let it soak in for a minute. Um, so behavioral clues also include acquiring a lethal mean, um, so a gun or pills, um, putting personal affairs in order, um, planning out who who they may give their prized possessions to. Um, if 
if it's something that is really near and dear to them and they've decided to give it to somebody, um, that is a warning sign. Um, set an interest or disinterest in religion. Um, drug or alcohol abuse or relapse after a period of recovery. Um, an unexplained anger, aggression, or irritability. And I think that one of the important points to make about some of these last bullets is that these these will be things that are out of character for them. So, um, yeah, if it if the the pattern of abuse of alcohol has changed, um, something like that that's out of the ordinary for that person, then then it may be a behavioral clue. Situational clues. Um, loss of any major relationship. I jumped to this one just because there's um, there's a connection with what we talked about. Um, there may be loss of a major relationship. There may be violence in a relationship that that may be triggering. Um, we see being fired or expelled from school. So for both the adult and the youth populations, this this could be um, one of the situational clues. Recent unwanted move, the death of a spouse, child, or best friend, especially if by suicide. Um, a diagnosis of a serious or a terminal illness. So we can see um, walking through these bullet points that some of these may be more common for different age populations. Um, this diagnosis of a serious or terminal illness, while it could affect anyone of any age, we do see a lot of the older population having, um, having experienced this. Sudden unexpected loss of freedom or fear of punishment. Um, this may be incarceration, um, or it could be something as seemingly trivial to someone as like having their iPhone taken away. Um, we see this in youth. So anticipated loss of financial security, loss of a cherished therapist, counselor, or teacher, and fear of becoming a burden to others. Burdensomeness is a, a, a risk factor. Um, I have some additional youth-related clues, but I'm going to skip them since your clientele is mostly the adult population. Um, so tips for asking the suicide question. So the, the main tenant of this training is, is that we ask the question. Um, so here are some tips because it can be really difficult. Um, if in doubt, don't wait. Ask the question. So even if you think, ah, maybe, maybe I'm just overreacting, it's always it's always safer to ask, right? So if the person is reluctant about it, be, be persistent if you feel comfortable. Um, talk to the person alone in a private setting. If you, as a healthcare professional in this person's life, feel um, with their permission that a loved one that has come with them to their appointment can be in on the conversation, then, then it's good to bring them in with the, with the consent of the patient. Um, allow the person to talk freely. This is really what they need, just an open space to, to talk about what they're feeling. Um, give yourself plenty of time so you don't know how long this conversation might take or how long um, they're going to need to uh, kind of open up. Um, have your resources handy. And if, if this is something you want, I can get everyone QPR cards. They're, they're just booklets that go along with this training. Um, that you can keep with you. Otherwise, um, I I recommend having the lifeline number somewhere, having um, your counselor's name, any other information that might help. So, knowing who you can refer this person to um, at any immediately. So, um, how you ask the question is less important than that you ask it. Um, so here are just some examples of less direct ways to ask the question. Um, have you been unhappy lately? Have you been very unhappy lately? Um, have you been so very unhappy lately that you've been thinking about ending your life? And then do you ever wish you could go to sleep and never wake up? These are less direct approaches to asking. Um, you may find that, um, that asking more directly will yield um, more response. So 
direct approach. You know, when people are upset as you seem to be, they sometimes wish they were dead. I'm wondering if you're feeling that way too. Um, the second one I would modify. I don't want to tell anyone they look miserable. So I wonder if you're thinking about suicide. And the last one, the most direct, are you thinking about killing yourself? If you feel comfortable being direct, I recommend it. Um, if you cannot ask the question, find someone who can. So uh, if you feel that someone needs to be asked the question, but you don't feel comfortable asking, it's important to, to find someone who will and talk to the person about it. Um, so this is not a good way to ask the question. Um, there's a lot of, of judgment behind this phrasing. You're not suicidal, are you? You're telling them that they shouldn't be, um, kind of what, what your stance would be if they said that maybe they were, which they probably wouldn't if this question was phrased this way. Um, so try to avoid this, um, this leading kind of judgmental questioning. Um, the P stands for persuade. Um, this part is about how to persuade somebody to stay alive. Um, so once you've asked the question, uh, if they have opened up and said, yes, fact, I have been thinking about suicide, listen to the problem, give them your full attention, don't rush, don't rush the conversation, don't rush to any judgment. Um, your job isn't to judge them, but to listen and then get them connected to the services that they need. Um, and remember that suicide is not the problem, only the solution to a perceived insoluble problem. So there's something that's causing this person to decide that suicide is the answer to their problem. Um, so keeping that in mind um, is good. Offer hope in any form. Um, so after we've kind of offered hope and listened, um, we want to ask if they will go with me to get help. So here, this first bullet is the best way. Um, go with that person to get help. Um, will you go with me to get help? Will you let me help you get help? Will you promise me not to kill yourself until we found some help? So them letting them know that you care, that you want to help them get help, that their problem is worth your while, um, that can make a huge difference, um, just that in itself. So this last letter in the QPR is R, refer. Suicidal people often believe they can't be helped, so you might have to, to do more for them. Um, as I said, the best, the best referral is going with a person to the service, to the source of help. Um, the next best thing would be to get a commitment from them to, to seek help and then making arrangements for them to get that help. So if you can't go with them at that time saying, okay, let's, let's make an appointment and then we'll go from there. The third best referral is to give referral information, um, try and get a commitment from them that they will not complete or attempt suicide. So this is giving them the crisis line number. And I would say this kind of um, triage format we have set up here for what the best referral is, um, is definitely like based on the, the person and if they're in crisis mode or if they um, are feeling down. You know, if, if it's a more immediate concern, definitely um, the emergency room is an option, um, calling calling the crisis line, finding out what the best source of action is for immediate help. Um, and then if it's, if it's more, um, if it's less urgent, um, these, these second two can be really good. But um, connecting them to services is really what this is all about. Um, and remember, since almost all efforts to persuade someone to live instead of attempt suicide will be met with agreement and relief, don't hesitate to get involved or take the lead. So this cannot be, there cannot be a downside to asking the question and helping that person get help. Um, 
for effective QPR, here are just a few tips um, for offering hope. I want you to live. I'm on your side. We'll get through this. Um, getting others involved, um, definitely with the consent of the patient or whoever you're talking about, ask the person who might be a good person for you to involve, um, any family or friends. A support network, as we saw when I was listing out the protective factors, is it's really crucial. So having people, not just one person, that they can talk to and be supported by will make a world of difference. Um, so I'm sure you guys have ideas for who could be in a person's support team. Um, join the team. So offer to work with the clergy, the therapist, the psychiatrist, whomever is going to provide the counseling or treatment. Um, having, having this is the same idea as the support network. Um, if you've referred somebody um, to help and you're not sure how they're doing, it, it is really, really great to follow up with a visit, a phone call, a card, um, whatever feels comfortable to you, but let the person know you care about what happens to them. Um, because that goes a long way. Um, so this is just the, the closing remark from QPR. When you apply QPR, you plant the seeds of hope, and hope helps prevent suicide. Um, here are some suicide resources for Utah. We have the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, Utah. Um, they have a very active chapter here in this state. Anything you need, um, they would be definitely willing to help out, be a reference. Um, the Uni Crisis Line, um, that is out of the university, the Neuropsychiatric Unit or Institute. Um, so that is the, the local crisis line. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, directs back to our local crisis line, but it's, it's um, a simple number to remember. Um, the Trevor Project is a good resource for any youth, um, especially LGBTQ youth. And then UtahSuicidePrevention.org is the website for the Utah Suicide Prevention Coalition, um, which is a very active statewide coalition. Um, and they have a lot of wonderful resources on that web page. So I would recommend visiting it. There's trainings if you are interested in more, more training or just having kind of a quick um, reference to look up suicide, warning signs, risk factors, um, how to help kind of information. On my next slide, I wanted to put up the domestic violence, DV is domestic violence resources. Um, the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition, um, udvc.org, and they run the 24-hour link line. Um, that is for anybody experiencing a domestic violence crisis, um, the national DV hotline um, comes as a chat, so if they would rather do it online, um, www.thehotline.org, and then that's the phone number. Um, this link, I'm going to, on the next slide, I'll show you what the link is. Um, and then the Utah Coalition Against Sexual Assault, um, they are a wonderful resource as well and have trainings available. So this, um, Futures Without Violence, this is intimate partner violence screening and counseling toolkit available for free online. There are a lot of great resources here if you want to start implementing something simple in your workplace um, to kind of screen for intimate partner violence. Um, so I will send out my slides so you have all these links, but um, I'd recommend visiting this as a resource too because it's great. Um, just some additional resources um, for specific cultural considerations with suicide. Um, yeah, so everyone plays a role in suicide prevention. So hopefully I've been able to enlighten you a little bit about warning signs, um, risk factors, how to reach out and know a little bit about where to get help. Um, so that's all. Teresa is my supervisors, we're both very involved in both suicide prevention and the intimate partner violence prevention. So feel free to contact either of us um, if you have any questions or like follow up. And that's all I have. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now or chat them. Great, thank you. Thank you, Megan. As, as Megan mentioned, you can post your questions. Um, down below, or I'm going to take everyone off mute 
but um, sometimes we have difficulty with that so that you can ask your question. So I'll take everybody off me. Muted. I don't think it sounds like there's any questions. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me now? Everyone hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Yes. <laughs> I was talking this whole time and I like Christy's like, I can't hear you. Okay, so everyone if you ha if anyone has questions, you can pose them now to Megan or um, the slides will we'll send the slides out. Megan has agreed to share her slides with us and we'll send them out on the listserv and her contact information. Um, does anyone have questions that they would like to ask online? You're, everyone should be unmuted. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, I unfortunately, I could not get to the first part of the webinar. Um, I saw the, I got the QPR, um, how to address um, the problem, um, in how to identify I know that if they have been mentioning or joking around taking up their lives, like that's a sign. But my question is, when do I bring it up? I think that you could bring it up at any time. If you, I know that some some people may feel it taking things out of, you know, out of proportion if somebody is joking about suicide, but. I don't yeah. think um, there's any damage in just asking, you know, like, hey, are you are you feeling suicidal? Um, are you thinking about this? And if they say if they say no, then then you, like you've asked the question. Um, okay. I would say that's what I would say in terms of like people joking about it. Um, it's not it's not a joking matter. I think sometimes you can you could tell if someone. Yeah if it's in their personality to joke like that, but if it's out of character or if you just however you feel like your gut reaction, um, but there's no, there's never damage in asking the question. Okay, but my, my question too is, um, would that also help them uh, realize, oh, wait, I have been, wow, I, I shouldn't be joking about this, you know? Would it cause that, and then, or would that um, also cause them, if they are suicidal and are not willing to share, uh, would that cause them to just close mm -hmm. up, close up more? And I don't know uh, if you could hear so, me. Yeah, I can hear you. My reaction. So those are two two questions. So um, oh yeah, sorry. Would it? No, that's okay. It, would it cause them to close up about it? My yeah. my initial thought about that is is no, maybe they wouldn't tell you initially, but they know that you are someone that is willing to talk to them about it non-judgmentally, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So they may disclose yeah. in the future. And um, your first point about kind of pointing it out to them that maybe they shouldn't be joking about it, I would say that's a positive. Yeah, true, true. Okay. Um, that's a good point. 
because I've had experiences when I perceive someone might be, but I'm afraid to ask. So, yeah, this is definitely good to know. Oh, good, good. Um, I think that would do it. Mm. Yeah, and like I said, you know, we, we did that myth buster. There's no, like, talking about suicide does not create a suicidal, like, ideation, you know? So there's no damage in asking it. And if anything, you're letting that person know that you are someone they can talk to and that you you don't really treat suicide as a joke. And I think that's pretty beneficial. Okay. Okay. Thank you for asking questions. <laughs> no, yeah, no problem. Okay, are there other questions? Okay, Megan, there's oh, there's one more. Okay. Uh, Hello. It looks like there's another question, but. Okay. Looks like the question might have been about when other slides will be sent out. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, I can send them um, today to to Kaylin. Right, and I'll I'll just send them out to the group. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, would you get the email? I mean, our emails from when we register? Yes, I'll just send it out to the whole group. Yeah. Okay. I'll send okay. it out through the listserv where you receive the invitation. So okay. Megan, there is there is one more question. It says, what would you do if the victim of a domestic violence does not want help? Um, I think that is, is common, maybe. I, I think that offering, letting them know that there's help available. Um, the same, the same kind of sentiment I expressed during the suicide question, um, letting them know that it's available, that you are someone that they can talk to or come to. Um, ultimately, it is, you know, it's on on a victim or a survivor of domestic violence to make the best decision for themselves. Um, there are a lot of reasons that people stay in violent relationships, so um, we can't decide for them if they're going to get help or what their what their course of action will be. Um, so just kind of being a support to them. Um, and I know that can be hard and frustrating. That's, that's my answer. <laughs> if you're if you are very concerned about their life, like if their life is in danger, um, there may be other other actions to kind of intervene, like if it's a crisis moment. Um, but other than that, it has to be it has the choice to get help has to be the victim. Okay, the next question. Um, says, how would you reach out to someone with domestic violence who is being monitored all the time to help them? Oh, wait, how can you, sorry, can you repeat? How would you help uh -huh. the person being monitored? Go ahead. Sorry, uh, yeah. So how would you reach out to someone with domestic violence who is being monitored all the time? Oh, so maybe so being monitored by an abuser. Yeah. Um, that is, that's also really tricky. Um, so if there's ever a private moment to have with that person in a, in a patient setting, um, I know that people have put up kind of um, help flyers like the domestic violence crisis line in bathrooms. Um, if, that, if that is something that is applicable, having, having them access that in a private space um, is really important for their safety. You're absolutely right. Um, I I think that can be very problematic, but um, getting, you know, if you're in, in a health, I am not sure what format you meet with people, but if you are in a health clinic setting, having the policy that you meet with, you meet with people alone at least at some point during their session um, might be beneficial. I know definitely perpetrator behavior is, um, 
is complex and may not allow for such things, but um, I think also subtly offering help, like if you ever needed, not specifically saying if you ever needed help with a with an intimate partner violence situation, but just letting them know that they, that you're someone that they can reach out to, or um, or saying this person, referring them specifically to a name, not necessarily an organization, that can be of help to them. Um, potentially about something else. I don't know. You're right. It does have to be very discreet. I hope that helps. That was kind of a, a mumbo jumbo. Answer. Okay, and it looks like the next question. Um, actually, it looks like there's a follow up to that question. What if you did not resolve the problem uh, during the one on one session? Um, I guess if the problem wasn't resolved during a one on one session, I'm, I might do, I don't know what your policies allow for, but um, follow up. Um, can be really helpful, letting them know, just, hey, how, how are you doing? Or connecting them. Um, you might make a referral to, um, if you feel that, that there's violence in a relationship, making a referral to a victim, a victim advocate um, or like um, family services. Um, and they might be able to open up a case if, if you feel that something is, is, if someone's life is in danger. Uh, and who can they contact to refer patients to? To refer patients to? For the, for intimate partner violence? Yes. So I have sent the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition is really good. Um, if they need um, like a therapist who is trained in trauma-informed care, um, they will be able to help. So UDVC. Um, I I can help in terms of like if you have specific this is what this person needs I can help you find you the provider find something that might be appropriate um, so really just knowing the resources in your community but the UDVC is an amazing resource and um, they are connected to a lot of the crisis centers we have um, we have domestic violence crisis um, centers around the state. Um, and they not necessarily they do provide shelter, but they offer more services than just shelter, and can be a, an important resource for that as well. Okay. And the next question is: How common is it for people with Alzheimer's to commit suicide? That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer. I do know that people with with brain injury. Um, do you have do you have more risk? I can I can look into that and send my findings with my slides to Kaylin. So I'm gonna write that down because I don't know the answer. Okay. I think we are, does, there are no more questions, Megan, at this time. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank, um, want to thank you, Megan, for taking time out of your day to come and present to us on this sensitive topic. And I'm sure it will be very useful for the clinics and when they interact with patients. So thank you for your time. Um, well, thank you for having me. Please let me know if you need anything else. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, Megan. Um, everyone, thank you for joining the call today. Um, if those of you who have colleagues who are unable to attend, the session will be recorded and made available probably um, later next week. Thanks, and have a great day.